Thank you so much, Mr. Ellsberg. Um, recently, we're many of us on this call. I know myself. We're from Los Angeles, um, one of the seats of the aerospace industry. What a euphemism! And recently on PBS, there was a, like a history of aerospace, and I remember seeing there that there, right after the end of World War II, um, when peace could have broken out. Um, Several of the heads of the aerospace industry, the war industry at that time, went to Congress and basically begged them. They said, don't shut us down. Where, what will the LA economy do? And instead of having any sense of creativity or morality, they basically kept it running. So in so, in so much of this way that it's, it's a jobs program. I'm a high school teacher again, and, and so many kids are being funneled into, uh, into these um, jobs afterwards. Um, also, I train as an engineer and many engineers around the country all say it's hard to find a job in something that isn't um, outside of, in some way, the military industrial complex. I want to say that um, I saw recently a great webinar, Code Pink webinar, Carly Town did um, on a transition. So, you know, we talk in the LA area about pollution. We need a just transition out of fossil fuels. We also need a just transition out of the war economy into the peace economy. Let's feminize our economy. But um, that's a great webinar. And um, I would like to, to point you all towards that. Uh, next, we're a little bit of hope. We are flashback to hope. How about that? We're going to have a reading. And this is an excerpt from um, the second Bill of Rights State of the Union speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it's going to be read by Madison Tang um, with the Code Pink Peace Collective. It is our duty now to begin to lay the plans and determine the strategy for the winning of a lasting peace and the establishment of an American standard of living higher than ever before known. We cannot be content, no matter how high that general standard of living may be, if some fraction of our people, whether it be one third or one fifth or one tenth, is ill-fed, ill-clothed, ill-housed and insecure. This Republic had its beginning and grew to its present strength under the protection of certain inalienable political rights, among them the right of free speech, free press, free worship, trial by jury, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. The, they were our rights to life and liberty. As our nation has grown in size and stature, however, as our industrial economy expanded, these political rights proved inadequate to assure us equality in the pursuit of happiness. We have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In our day, these economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. We have accepted, so to speak, a second bill of rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative, and remunerative job in the industries or shops or farms or mines of the nation the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products as a return at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, and the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security, and after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. America's own rightful place in the world depends in large part upon how fully these and similar rights have been carried into practice for all of our citizens. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. Thank you, Madison. We read that at the first Cold War Truth Commission also. It was December of 2017. And uh, you know who was in the air, but also Bernie Sanders was very much in the air. And we basically made the point that how is it possible that in 1944, those words, those sentiments, those policies, were almost law of the land. 
And yet here we were in 2017 or 2020, 21. And we're so far from that. And Bernie Sanders couldn't even be our candidate. What happened in that interim to the American psychology, the, the, the American body politic? And our argument is that the Cold War happened to this country. Next, we're going to have uh, Rosanna Cambron, and she will be giving testimony uh, for our Cold War Truth Commission. She is the co-chair of the National Communist Party, USA, and a coordinator of the Worker Center in Los Angeles. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for uh, inviting us here today and for this event, which I think is, is going to be a vital uh, resource for many generations to come. Um, in 1919 was a crucial year in history. Throughout the world, new parties emerged from existing socialist parties and anti-colonial uh, anti movements. They united around the struggle for socialism and against imperialism. In the United States, the Communist Party USA was born. Many immigrants came to the United States fleeing poverty and persecution. Some had been involved with socialist movements in the lands from which they came. They would, they would be joined by African-American activists who had faced the highest level of exploitation and oppression in the United States, fighting for three centuries against slavery and then Jim Crow. Indigenous people, Mexican-Americans, and people of the US colonies of Puerto Rico and, and Philippines, along with Japanese and Chinese Americans, all of whom were victims of violent, racist exploitation and oppression. U.S. communists emphasized the oppression of what was then called the Negro people as a cornerstone of capitalist rule. They made the organization of black rural and, and ur urban workers into unions a central focus of their work. They also organized both and black and white working people to fight against all forms of racism. Many of the struggles in which communists had played a leading role in the 1920s had ended in defeat. The 1926 Paciac New Jersey silk strike and the later Castonia North Carolina mill strike had been violently crushed. Zacco and Vanzetti died in the electric chair in 1927. But communists strengthened by the world communist movement and a political structure of a revolutionary party that united them learned from these setbacks. The capitalist utopian dream of letting the rich take care of the poor collapsed in the great market uh, crash of October, 1929. Over the next four years, unemployment rose to more than a third of the workforce. Wages for employed were slashed and millions lost their savings. In March of 1930, communists in the US and throughout the world organized International Unemployment Day to mobilize against this crisis. Shortly thereafter, unemployment councils led by the communist Herbert Benjamin organized in cities throughout the country to block the evictions of thousands of tenants who could not pay their rent. The unemployed councils were forward, came forward with a new idea, unemployment insurance, which was so identified with the communist party that the conservative, that the then conservative AFL leadership initially rejected the proposal and condemned it as a communist party program. Beginning in 1935, the New Deal program of uh, Franklin Roosevelt elected three years earlier at the height of the depression would enact unemployment insurance along with com comprehensive public works, labor and social welfare legislation collective bargaining units, social security, and later minimum wage and wages and the 48 hour work week, the most important victories for workers in US history. While the benefits were significantly less than the communist party and others had advocated for, the leading role of the communists in the unemployed councils and in the unions and community organizations made the communist party the undisputable head of a domestic Marxist movement towards socialism. As the New Deal government advanced labor and social welfare reforms in response to the working class upsurge, communists led in the formation of a new civil rights groups, the National Negro Co Congress, the, the, South, the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Both groups sought to build alliances with and through 
the CIO, the Works Progress Administration, and other New Deal agencies. Although these and other militant civil rights organizations, which communists helped to build, would be ruthlessly suppressed during the post-World War II period, many of the, their veterans activists would play important roles in the victories won during the great civil rights upsurge of the 1960s. Many civil rights leaders cut their political teeth in these struggles. As you can see that throughout these struggles, the Communist Party sought unity of the working class and recognized that racism was an effective tool by the capitalists to divide the workers. Communist Party activists struggled to build inclusive industrial unions since the birth of the Communist Party. By the early 1930s, a strike, wa a strike wave swept the nation. The Roosevelt administration responded to this working class upsurge by enacting National Labor Relations Act or Wagner Act, which provided a democratic process for workers to organize trade unions and negotiate collective bargaining agreements. Communists fought to advance the Fair Employment Practice Commission, which the New Deal government had created in 1941 to integrate black workers into the expanding war production industries. You can, now, you can find more in detailed history of the party in two uh, recent books, Let Them Tremble and Faith in the Masses by Tony Pesanovsky, which recounts how the party, despite its setbacks and anti-communism, continued to fight for workers' rights. Oops, As you can see by this brief history that the work of the Communist Party, along with other progressive organizations and individuals were building movements that were achieving important victories, especially around the fight against racism and winning workers' rights. The ruling elite responded to these gains by organizing a coordinated and strategic frontal assault. Though this war on workers started decades ago, these important worker gains called for an escalation. This occurred at the end of the World War II with the birth of the Cold War. The first step of this assault started as an ideological war. The thinking was, if we can convince the American people that capitalism equaled America, equaled liberty, equaled democracy, then one can deduce that capitalism equals the American way of life. Therefore, anything that is opposite capitalism was un-American, anti-freedom, undemocratic, and should be feared and rejected. Any attack on capitalism is an attack on American values. This successful media campaign laid the groundwork for one of the darkest chapters in our country's history, the McCarthy era. This state-sponsored witch hunt of communists caused hundreds to be blacklisted, thousands to lose their jobs, and dozens of the finest, most militant movement leaders to be jailed. The aim of this fascist campaign was never to silence the Communist Party and its members. Its true goal was to squash and paralyze it. Any and all progressive and, individual, uh, and individuals involved in bringing up fundamental political, economic, or social change. This same anti-communism line of attack was later used against Black Panthers, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and countless others. And although most of the laws and actions taken during the McCarthy period were eventually overturned and deemed unconstitutional, there is no denying it had a, lo a long and lasting impact on the American psyche. But even in the worst of times, the smear tactic was never absolute or permanent. Millions of Americans rejected anti-communism and refused to be silent. In time, new organizations were formed and new leaders arose, giving birth to new movements. Which brings us to today. So are the ideas of socialism, communism relevant and necessary today? I say yes, now more than ever. Endless wars, police brutality, gender inequality, con continued racism, increased income in inequality, massive homelessness, rampant consumerism, and an impending environmental catastrophe all call for change. The Trump presidency is a reflection of the new and more dangerous stage of struggle we are in. Trump may be gone, but the fascist forces that put him in office are still there and are organizing. 
But with all of these problems now is not the time to despair. The winds of change are strong and they are blowing in our favor. National organizations are growing everywhere. Movements are coalescing and trade unions are getting their militant groove back. The younger generation is, now easily inf is not easily influenced by the anti-communist narrative. They are looking for an alternative to the life they are currently living under. Climate change, high cost of education, and lack of jobs. Bernie Sanders, AOC, and the rest of the squad are countering that negative socialist narrative and making it cool again. Are they still using anti-communism as a weapon 30 years after the collapse of Soviet Union and the supposedly end of communism? Absolutely. In fact, in the last election, it was Trump and the Republican Party's first line of attack. They tried to stir and awaken old prejudices and fears of claiming that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party were trying to replace American values with, a socialist, with socialist ones. Another attempt was in a recent CNN article that equated the attack on the Capitol by white supremacists with the communist arrest made during the Cold War. During the last election, several attempts were also made to equate fascism with communism. But much more insidious than all of this was their use of anti-communism to brainwash and mislead many into voting against their own self-interest. They have been able to convince millions of their working class supporters to oppose tuition free uh, college, a free national healthcare, student loan forgiveness, because these are socialist programs that go against American values. Anti-communism continues to be the ruling class weapon of choice in the battle of ideas. As we move forward, I cannot overstress the importance of building unity, being aware of the tactics that have been used to divide us. Some of their tactics include looking for ways to divide leaders using their weaknesses, both personal and ideological to promote division. Spreading rumors and feeding egos is another critical form we need to be mindful of. In closing, I would like to invite all of you to join our party in convincing our families, our communities, our country that socialism is not a dirty word, it is our salvation. The sooner we do this, the sooner we can begin to organize more effectively to address poverty, racism, gender inequality, war, the climate crisis, and so much more. Thank you. Brava, Rosanna. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony. A couple of things before we move on to another moving testimony is um, at our first, uh, first Cold War Truth Commission, we made signs and you could take a selfie and the sign said, fellow traveler, EK, and what of it? And so I think whatever we are, however we identify, the more allies we have um, possible and to be una unabashed and unafraid um, of who our friends are because look at, what, look at what they're up to, look at what they do, their values. I wanna mention someone else who was at the first Cold War Truth Commission. He couldn't be with us now, but he was one of the first African-American um, city councilmen of Los Angeles. His name was Bob Farrell, Robert Farrell. And he made a super point that I want to just make sure um, is, is in the record today also that Rosanna um, spoke of. He says he remembers um, back in the 40s when the Communist Party, various labor um, organizers were helping the black community and that and that they were considered by by the black community some of their greatest allies. And then he said, and and as the Cold War continued, McCarthyism, they just all those white allies disappeared. They got picked off. They got jailed. They got, you know, they had to leave to Mexico, whatever. And all of a sudden the, the black community really felt without allies. And um, I just found that so, so tragic um, and, and um, immoral. Um, I wanted to bring that up. So our next, um, and it will be a, a short film. Um, and I want to give a shout out to my partner, John Lackner, who um, has helped me make the couple of film clips that we have made. So a, a great um, sound man and film editor. And our next um, our next testimony will be, and we're, we have some pictures, <laughs> some pictures that I think we're going to show as I'm giving the background on Mr. Mirpal. 
So Michael Mirapol is the older son of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. We are honored to have his testimony here today. Since 1974, he and his brother Robert have been actively involved in seeking to discover and expose the truth about their parents' case. In 2016, they submitted over 50,000 signatures on a petition to President Obama asking for an official exoneration of their mother. In the course of their decades-long struggle, they have perforce learned a great deal about the Cold War, both domestic and foreign. This presentation focuses on dissenters from the American unanimity, which casts the U.S. as a defender of freedom from communist tyranny. This presentation is courtesy of the Encyclopedia of the American Left, which will be published online within the next year. And I just want to say uh, Mr. Mirapol gave us permission to put the images along with his words. So if there's any unprofessionalism in the images, it's not him, it's us. Thank you. In the early 1950s, Cold War assumptions dominated American public life. Almost unnoticed, three books were published, one by a young, unknown academic, one by a jailed communist, and one by a maverick reporter. These books began the effort to break through the closed-mindedness of American public opinion about the struggle for freedom with the Soviet Union. They marked the first appearance of Cold War revisionism, an argument against the virtually unanimous view that Soviet expansionism and worldwide subversion had necessitated a defensive military buildup by the United States and its allies, and even defensive wars in Greece, Korea, and French Indochina. William A. Williams authored American-Russian Relations, 1787 to 1947. He placed the beginning of the Cold War in the broad historical context of U.S. imperial concerns. The U.S. government had tried to reverse the revolution in Russia after 1917, and after World War II, aggressively opposed Soviet interests in Eastern Europe. The book was a strong scholarly rejoinder to the Kennan School of Containment. In the era of the Truman Doctrine and Korean War, even such a measured critique was too much for the establishment. The publisher submitted the chapter on Kennan to Foreign Affairs, the magazine of the foreign policy elite, but they returned it to Williams, stating it was interesting and provocative, but too personal in its a rebuttal of Kennan. The book made no apparent impact in academia, but was approvingly reviewed in the small left-wing press. Karl Marzani was serving a prison sentence for contempt of Congress. He wrote, We Can Be Friends, from published sources available in the prison library. This book showed that a careful reading of U.S. government documents, speeches of politicians, memoirs like those of Winston Churchill and the New York Times, could cast doubt on the consensus about Soviet blame for the Cold War. Meanwhile, journalist I.F. Stone, no supporter of Stalin, had discovered that the Korean War may very well have been caused by intra-Korean issues and not by the Soviet Union. Furthermore, he argued that the intervention of the Chinese was a result of legitimate Chinese security concerns. No one was willing to publish his book, so Paul Sweezy and Leo Huberman of the Monthly Review manuscript the first Monthly Review press book, The Hidden History of the Korean War. In historiography, revisionism means just what it sounds like. It represents the revising of previously accepted interpretations, a challenge to receive doctrine on the basis of new evidence, previously ignored evidence, new interpretations of agreed-upon evidence, or some combination thereof. New material becomes available, the issues of succeeding eras shed new light on those of the past. Thus, our understanding of historical events changes drastically as time passes. In the case of judgments about the origins and course of the Cold War, this is important because one's beliefs about the history of the Cold War can lead to two alternative conclusions. One, the U.S. was dragged into its role as the defender of the free world due to the imperial ambitions of Stalin's Soviet Union, or the U.S. has always had imperial ambitions, and the Soviet Union, as well as the nationalist movements in the post-World War II era, were challenges that stood in the way. Williams expanded his investigations to include U.S. foreign policy in general. In 1959, he published The Tragedy of American Diplomacy. In 1960, Professor D.F. Fleming published The Origins and History of the Cold War. 
These two books mark the upsurge of post-McCarthy Cold War revisionism, with different emphases. Whereas Williams put the Cold War in the context of long-run U.S. economic and political expansionism, in a word, imperialism, Fleming felt that the Cold War was a serious departure from the more cooperative policy with the Soviets that had been followed by FDR during the wartime alliance. In the early 1960s, opposition to U.S. moves against the fledgling Cuban Revolution, as opposed to the virtual silence in this country during the 50s as the U.S. toppled governments in Iran and Guatemala, provided a context in which such revisionism could resonate. Williams brought out a second expanded edition of Tragedy in 1962 and published The United States, Cuba, and Castro with Monthly Review Press in the same year. The intellectual anti-interventionism of the early 1960s grew with opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam. Writing in the revisionist tradition expanded. Williams' colleagues and students even constituted a school within Cold War revisionism, emphasizing the concept of an open-door empire that had been implanted into the ideology of American leaders at least as early as the late 19th century. By 1968, Cold War revisionism was so successful in challenging received doctrine that no less a luminary than Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote an article saying, it's time to call a halt to this subversive revisionist doctrine. Meanwhile, the Fleming and Williams strands of Cold War revisionism were joined by a third in 1969 when Gabriel Kolko published The Politics of War, which opposed Fleming by tracing U.S. hostility to the Soviets and radical nationalist movements back into the years of the wartime alliance. Kolko eschewed the Williams Open Door imperialism interpretation. He gave no credence to the rhetoric of idealism sounded by individuals like Woodrow Wilson. To Kolko, such verbalizations merely represented the most cynical of manipulations and not a genuine contradiction of ideals with practices as they were for Williams. In 1973, Princeton University Press published The New Left and the Origins of the Cold War, an attack on Williams, Kolko, Fleming, and others. The book received a favorable front-page review in the New York Times. Despite attacks, revisionism continued to develop into the 1990s. Graduate students and even undergraduates were at least aware that there was an alternative interpretation of the role of the United States as an alleged defender of the free world. Scholarship in the revisionist tradition informed the movements against intervention in Central America in the 1980s and the no war for oil arguments against the First and Second Gulf Wars. Williams had argued that when the expansionist impulse contradicted our supposed national commitment to self-determination, the U.S. sacrificed that alleged commitment. As congressional hearings during the 1980s indicated, pursuit of certain imperial aims in Central America caused collaboration with drug runners. Meanwhile, followers of Colco have argued that this shows that our nation's idealistic commitments are the rhetoric of imperial self-justification and nothing more. With the overthrow of communism in Eastern Europe and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the Cold War ended. Cold War revisionism seemed to have lost its political immediacy and became mostly a dispute among historians. However, a significant effect of decades of revisionist scholarship was the infiltration into American intellectual life of the view that the United States is an empire rather than an anti-imperialist republic. Many influenced by Williams, Kolko, and others in that first generation of Cold War revisionists continue to analyze the persistence of American imperial ambitions, even when the excuse of the danger of Soviet expansionism was no longer available. However, the history profession, for the most part, has been smitten by the victory of the United States and the West in the Cold War. Despite the disasters of American imperial overreach in the Middle East as a result of the First and Second Gulf Wars and the worldwide War on Terror launched by the Bush administration, the history profession seems to have decided that it's safe to ignore the view of revisionists. See, for example, John Gaddis's restatement, The Cold War, A Short History, which doesn't have a reference to any work of Cold War revisionism in the bibliography and doesn't honor any of the revisionist arguments with even a cursory attempt at refutation. However, reality intrudes. 
Work by Andrew Basevich, Chalmers Johnson, and other analysts of American military overreach in the era since the fall of the Soviet Union continue to document the tragedy of American diplomacy and militarism. Basevich, a retired military officer, West Point graduate, has identified the Naval Academy graduate Williams as one of his major influences. See American Empire, the realities and consequences of U.S. diplomacy. Johnson, who served with the CIA in Korea and calls himself a Cold Warrior, began writing in opposition to America's overreach in the post-9-11 world. He has argued, quote, A nation can be one or the other, a democracy or an imperialist, but it can't be both. If it sticks to imperialism, it will, like the old Roman Republic, lose its democracy to a domestic dictatorship. See his blowback, The Costs and Consequences of American Empire. In an ironic twist, the foreign policy of President Donald J. Trump was very popular because he at least talked about pulling the U.S. back from worldwide military commitments. With the post-Trump Biden administration promising that, quote, America is back and attempting to reassert American leadership in the world against various nationalist forces and a perceived Chinese threat to Western capitalist hegemony, there will be plenty for future historians to study about the persistent efforts of American leaders to preserve, protect, and defend not the Constitution of the United States, but America's 21st century empire. Thank you. Thank you for Michael Maripol. We are going to have uh, Frank introduce um, our next reading. I just want to say that the Rosenbergs have started the Rosenberg Fund for Children, and they help out the children <clears throat> of activists who have been persecuted. So a very worthwhile organization, and they call it Constructive Revenge. Frank? Okay, uh, thanks, Rachel. Dr. Gerald Horn holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies. His research has addressed issues of race and a variety of relations involving labor, politics, civil rights, and war. Dr. Horn received his PhD in history from Columbia University and his JD from the University of California, Berkeley. And I'll say I've heard uh, Gerald Horn many times over the years on KPFK with Margaret Prescott. And now we're going to have somebody read what he submitted. That's it. Uh, Genesis Mora will be reading, and she is a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, youth member. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> okay. I welcome the Cold War Truth Commission as I salute the organizers of this forum. Assuming we elude the minefields left by the detritus of this US engineered debacle, including nuclear war and climate change, future historians will no doubt conclude that the Cold War was possibly the largest self-inflicted wound a nation has inflicted upon itself. It is not simply the trillions spent on war and conflict while education, healthcare, and the nation's infrastructure was left to wither on the vine. It is not simply the Cold War compliment, speaking of the Red Scare, which demonized the tallest trees in our forest including Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Dubois, Shirley Graham Dubois, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and Claudia Jones, compromising the working class of various stripes ideologically. The Cold War and its evil twin, the Red Scare, also led to an assault on progressive unions, including West Coast Longshore and the National Maritime Union, which devastated the leading working class folk while making the strategic sector less able to defend itself against the ascendancy of right-wing populism as evidenced by Trumpism. Still, the most harmful aspect of the Cold War was manifested in the realm of US foreign policy. It was not just that the reigning ideology of anti-communism led to a de facto alliance with apartheid South Africa during the pre-1994 era, not to mention colonialism in the sub-region. The Cold War also contributed to a pernicious global trend manifested most dramatically in Afghanistan, wherein a left-leaning government was destabilized, beginning most avidly in the 1970s, which included an alliance with religious zealots. 
This gambit brought the latter to power and led directly to an attack on New York City and Northern Virginia on 11 September 2001. This global trend of attacks on secular forces while cuddling intense religiosity has also been manifested on these shores as we witnessed the explosion of white Christian nationalism on 6 January 2021. The Cold War reached a turning point a half a century ago when Henry Kissinger flew to China to effectuate an anti-Soviet alliance with China. This not only led to US imperialism taking a soft line via these, the murderous Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, but also to an attack on Vietnam by China near that same time. Still, what drove this entente was the notion that Washington should seek to drive a wedge between Moscow and Beijing. However, by 2021, it is precisely this eventuality which has emerged, leading to the harebrained policy of dual containment, whereby Washington will seek to confront both giants simultaneously. Worse, from the viewpoint of US imperialism, is that part of the payoff to China for the 1970s bargain, massive direct foreign investment, has created a juggernaut, placing China in the passing lane with consequences too gargantuan to imagine. The question needs to be posed. How and why did this catastrophe unfold? To answer this potent query involves a deeper investigation and innovation of US history. Specifically, we need to move sharply away from the gauzy, romanticized view of the founding of this republic, which after all involved genocide against the indigenous and tightening of the chains binding the enslaved African population and ultimately the nascent US moving by the 1790s to control the African slave trade to Cuba and doing the same in the largest market of all, Brazil by the 1840s. Post 1865, one espies a further drive to expropriate and liquidate the indigenous population, culminating in the 1890s with the overthrow and seizure of the regime in the Hawaii archipelago and the annihilation of the tottering Spanish empire and the effective seizure of Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Given this bloody genocidal history, should any be surprised by US depredations in Korea, Vietnam, Guatemala, Iran, the Congo, Panama, Grenada, Iraq, Libya, and other tortured sites too numerous to mention. So what is to be done? We should all join and or hail the campaign to move the money from the Pentagon to human needs, reducing the Pentagon budget and joining Congresswoman Barbara Lee in similar efforts should be seen as the highest priority. And we should back the passage of HR 40, a step towards reparations to the descendants of enslaved Africans, a step towards making the Native American population whole while opening the door to somehow seeking to compensate the countless victims of US imperialism. Wonderful, thank you, Genesis. Go PSL. <laughs> thank you for reading uh, Gerald Horn's words for the, on the Cold War, thank you. Next, we are going to have Carol Francis. This is a film clip historical from the First uh, Truth Commission. Carol Francis is a retired LA Unified teacher, LA Unified School District teacher, a playwright and longtime Cuba solidarity activist in Los Angeles. Listen closely to how far back anti-communism in America goes. Thank you. And now we're going to end our with one last testimony uh, and uh, this first panel on the early years of um, anti-communism in the United States and it goes back even further than a hundred years ago. Well, um, you, I just want to ask you what was the first movement to be red baited? Was the first movement in what decade where somebody called communists because of their work? Go ahead, shout it out. Any ideas? What's the earliest movement that you can think of that was red baited? Labor. Labor, what year? What uh, decade? 1870s. 
1870s later, anybody earlier than that? Actually, it was the 50s, the 1850s. Um, I was, it was the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement. I was in Nicaragua, in Manama, Nicaragua, with a group of people who were there from all over the world showing solidarity with the Sandinista Revolution. And I was talking with another U.S. American, somebody I knew from L.A., and these two Canadians came over holding this book. This book is called Labor's Untold Story. Um, it was written in the 1950s, uh, Labor Movement Struggle. Um, they said, have you seen this book? And I said, yeah, I've seen it. I haven't read it yet. I said, you've got to read this, page 15. So they had these two Canadians showing us this book. So um, here it is, a quote from a slave apologist in 1850. Now bear in mind what happened in 1848. The, um, what was that? Communist Manifesto came out. I was born on the centennial of the Communist Manifesto, so I forget 1848. So 1848, 1850, those guys did not waste any time. 1850, this came out. The parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. They are atheists, socialists, communists, red republicans, Jacob Jacobins on one side, and the friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. And what's their freedom being regulated by this? Uh, and here's another quote. This is seven years later, 1857. We warn the North that everyone, the leading abolitionists, is agitating the Negro slavery question as a means to their ulterior ends. Socialism and communism no private property, no church, no law, free love, free land, free women, and free children. Lakers and Tolls, story page 15. Great. That is definitely um, a story that needs to be told. Labor's untold story. Red baiting of anti-slavery activists. There you have it. Has nothing to do with the Soviet Union is our part and human rights and all of that. It's a, it's a battle of ideas. Um, our next person giving testimony is a dear friend of mine, Rick Fellows. He has been a caravan driver and mechanic for many Latin American indigenous environmental, social and economic justice solidarity caravans. He's a media activist, researcher of underreported news and analysis, critic of corporate power and global trade agreements, an alternative energy and appropriate technology researcher and advocate. He has worked in Cuba, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico between 1988 and 2011 with IFCO, Pastors for Peace, and other organizations. Your testimony, Rick? Yeah, I, I guess I've been having a little trouble hearing some of the audio, so I don't know what's been said, but, um, but I talk, talking about fascism and uh, the reality of fascism that I think Mussolini said that corporations, that corporatism was pretty much the same thing as fascism. And I think that we need to go back to, to looking at corporations and how much power they've gained uh, since World War II, where, where really German corporations operated in the United States under proxy boards and US corporations operated in Germany profit, profiting off of that war under proxy German boards for the duration of the war. So. IBM was 
critical to data processing for figuring out who was going to which death camp and how to take their property away systematically using punch card operations and that um, <clears throat> a lot of things can kind of go back to that. And then um, in 1947, the New York Times was lamenting that the most powerful corporations in the world coming out of World War II were likely to be corporations that had run and profited off of death camps in Nazi Germany. So, you know, we've had hearings of Nazi leaders and, you know, chasing down Nazi war criminals. But the reality is that, you know, I used to read Covert Action Quarterly regularly, and there was pretty good documentation, I remember. Uh, that some of the first operations of the CIA were to ship Nazi war criminals to Latin America and to get the Vatican to give them church papers so that they could show up in a number of different countries in Latin America wearing church collars and and that you know meantime I think in the first years of the CIA they were flipping governments this way and that and establishing national security states. And I think we know that some of these national security states had Nazi war criminals as advisors. That, um, so and in the context of World War II, the whole world got gifted this idea of a, you know, that we're going to live with a nuclear bomb forever. And that you know, we all have to live with the idea that we could be vaporized in an instant. You know, and corporations have been a part of that, that uh, it's given a lot of impetus to have a national security apparatus that um, doesn't have to tell the truth to the American public, the press, or to even to Congress. And that a lot of it is kind of about protecting corporate power and um, they make a lot of money off war production and you know the cold war it kind of needed to be created i haven't found a lot on this but there's a fantastic book uh, by uh, gerard colby and charlotte dennett called thy will be done about uh, evangelism and missionaries being used in indigenous areas of Latin America as a sort of a front line to penetrate. But uh, he talked about how Nelson Rockefeller was involved in uh, under Eisenhower sort of crafting the Cold War in his position. Uh, he had a powerful position under Eisenhower restructuring the federal government. But I, I do think that the Cold War was crafted, that they would provoke incidents and create situations and try to get the Soviet Union to over respond in their defense uh, because of the intense fear that the Soviet Union have ho had of hostile governments being put in on its periphery. And um, and when they did overreact, they got years of, you know, fear mongering propaganda in the US to try to make it out that the Soviet Union was a threat to the world and, you know, downplay the fact that the US had cut them off of warm water ports and trade routes and technology and ringed them with hostile military bases, putting missile launchers in Turkey and Korea, and, you know, that we didn't really have, I mean, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we never had the feeling that the Soviets might have had, like if we had nuclear missiles being installed in Mexico and Canada, you know. So I think we've been looking at the world through a one-way mirror and that corporations have been riding their way to uh, kind of a future where corporations are the main 
dominating factor in world affairs that you know everywhere you go it's the same corporations and we know our political system in the united states is bought and sold like both parties are controlled by corporation corporate money the citizens united decision opened the floodgate to where we already had a severe problem we tried to reform campaign laws in the 70s and the Supreme Court kept coming back saying corporations have the rights of speech like uh, like any other person, <laughs> you know, except they don't die, they're immortal, they live forever, they've got all the rights of people except the right to eventually die of old age. Um, so I don't know, I guess that's what I wanted to kind of I guess I have seven minutes and I know that Thank can go you. fast, uh, but I wanted <laughs> to kind you, of Rick. focus, you know, my time on like trying to center back to corporations and the, that we need to struggle against corporate power. And, you know, it was a real big shot heard around the world when, when all the people blocked the delegates from getting into the WTO meetings in Seattle here. Um, that, Thank you. Know, you. We Thank kind you, of need Rick. to get back to figuring out how we're going to take on the corporate beast and um, okay. and figure out how we can have a more democratic future and have a public that isn't exclusively informed by corporate dominated media. Thank you, Rick. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. My time. Our day. Yes. Thank you. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. I just want to say that a lot of people are um, remembering you from the caravan days. And if it weren't for you, those buses wouldn't have run. So thank you very much. And and you did bring up he's in the Pacific Northwest, known for environmentalism, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, and definitely we need to figure out how to run humanity. And my feeling then is that it's going to be the planet that decides nature bats last. And she is going to decide how we run ourselves. And it, it's not currently the, the plan at hand. Uh, before we go on to our next person, I just want to mention, Rick mentioned um, timelines and the importance of knowing what came first in order to not blame one, you know, the side that maybe was on the defense. And there are a couple of great timelines, many. How about putting something in the chat if you know other books that read like timelines? They're very helpful. Um, Jane Franklin's, of course, uh, History, U.S.-Cuba Relations is a, is a seminal book in those timelines. Another one, and I, and I hope people on this call know her. She couldn't be with us today, but her name is Lisa Wolf. And if you are in New York, please look her up, knock on her door. Uh, she, uh, wherever she lives, but um, she has Cold War Studies. It's a, it's a blog. It's wonderful. And we are going to be putting later on in the chat a lot of her timeline. So go to her Cold War Studies Lisa Wolf blog. A lot of timelines of various countries. Um, very, very important information. Next, we're going to have Mike Feinstein. He is a founding member of the California Green Party. He was the mayor of Santa Monica from 2000 to 2002. His testimony today is from his direct experience from which he wrote his seminal book, 36 weeks with European Greens. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, Rachel. And um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Tú uh, tienes siete minutos, amor. Nada más. No, y saludos de México, donde estoy. Um, listen, I'm just sharing a little anecdote here because when Rachel invited me, I said like, all the experience I have in Europe, I'm in Europe a lot because I've been kind of the primary U.S. Green Party representative to European Green Parties. And you just don't find all the paranoia and people flinching when somebody says the word communist or communist party. And I've been kind of trying to think of, well, partly why is that different? My first experience with, what, with it actually was here in the state of Oaxaca in 1979 when I was doing my first hippie backpacking trip. And my good friend, Mike Hope, and I had met a couple of guys from Denmark and we were traveling with them. And I grew up in an upper middle class, leave it to Beaver suburb in Minneapolis. And this was the first time that I had heard people talking about different types of economic models and 
ways of organizing, organizing ourselves and shared economies and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And, and I hadn't really heard it before, but it was just a natural thing to come out from, from these Danes. So in all my times following up in Europe and in the cafes there and just in, in all the environment, people just treat it as another, the ones that I meet at least, just treat it as another political tendency and it's not weird. So by the way, the Green Party in, in um, the Netherlands was actually a merger of the Communist Party, the Pacific Socialist Party, the Radical Party, and the in, in, um, evangelical, evangelical People's Party. So just as an aside. So anyway, so why, why is it like that? A couple of things, I think. Um, one, it's a pedestrian culture. People aren't separated in cars. You're in public transit, you're in public plazas, you're used to being around other people and considering them as just part of your life and people of all classes instead of the separation that we have. That's one thing that kind of strikes me. Um, and then number two, their electoral system. Most European countries have proportional representation systems so that all sorts of people get elected and all sorts of political tendencies get elected and just part of the dialogue in our country where we've got this top-down duopoly, Democrats and Republicans um, control the dialogue. They uh, really repress, I know as a Green that's the case, they repress other political ideas and you're not really supposed to talk about those other ideas because they're spoilers to the system. So, you know, part of it I think is really how we're organized as people and the fact that we just don't have structures and habits and environments that promote inclusivity and diversity. And, you know, my insight's not much deeper than that, other than get out to cafes and talk politics. I wish we had more of that in our culture. And, and the final thing is imagine if Rachel, speaking of proportional representation and, and these kind of viewpoints, imagine if we had proportional representation and Rachel and Medea um, were both in the Congress, for example. And, and talking about these sort of issues and on TV. I mean, oh my God. So there it is. Um, and, you know, thanks for having me, Rachel. I'm not one of the giants like these other people you had, but I wanted to share that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Mike, too. Maybe if we had proportional representation, you'd come back to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it's okay. warmer. <laughs> Thank you. 